Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and listen to some of the speakers today. And uh, if you haven't had a chance, I do have a book out in the hallway called Victory in a No-Go Zone, which really talks about how the OPP and the Ontario government spent millions and millions of dollars to target me and the people in our group to be arrested and to be prosecuted, and not one single case was ever made to trial. Uh, the advantage, of course, of being arrested, if there is an advantage, is that the government is forced to turn over all their emails. And so much of the book is documents what Commissioner Fantino said in his emails, or Deputy Commissioner Chris Lewis said in his emails, that they, you know, they deleted to make sure that no one would get a copy. Of course, the court forced them to go to the backups and get the deleted email. Sounds like Kathleen Wynne and <laughs> McGinty government. If you don't know the story, in February of 2006, in a small community called Caledonia, roughly 10,000 people, a very small group of uh, Aboriginal people occupied a subdivision that was roughly 100 acres, roughly 10 houses had already been finished on that property, and claimed that the property was theirs. The OPP and the Ontario government and even the local mayor and council basically refused to do anything. As a result of uh, uh, the OPP's action, it went from a very peaceful, just simple protest that could have been ended in one day, to the Mohawk warriors moving in, to various union groups uh, busting in people, and to, on April the 20th of 2006, it was a near riot scene where n numerous officers were put in the hospital. The fire station, the uh, power station was firebombed and destroyed. You had to travel from one part of the town to another part of the town. You had to go through native checkpoints and have native issue passports to leave your home and to enter your home. For weeks, weeks, six weeks that went on. There was areas in this town that did not have police protection for four years. If you phoned 911, no one responded. And if you were the people who were committing the violence, knowing full well that the police were not responding, you can imagine, it doesn't matter what group it would be, those groups would automatically escalate the violence. By the time I got involved, I'm not from Caledonia, originally I was living north of Toronto, on Richmond Hill, and heard how OPP officers were kidnapped. They were tied up, their guns were taken off of them, their car was uh, burned, and the Toronto media reported that story as officers got lost and native protesters escorted them back to their fellow officers. Nothing about the kidnapping. Nothing about destroying the vehicle. And I didn't believe that this could be happening in Canada. And then on June 9th of 2006, and within a one and a half hour period of time, there was a senior couple driving through the main street of Caledonia, just visiting, and they got swarmed by these protesters. The, uh, the husband had a heart attack, you know, all the stress. The, the uh, C local CH camera crew was across the road videotaping what was going on. When the natives realized they were being videotaped, they rushed across the road, attacked the camera crew, put the camera guy in the hospital, took the camera gear. Okay? An hour later, in another part of the town, just about a quarter mile away, uh, there was an uh, unmarked uh, U.S. Uh, security van with a uh, U.S. ATF agent in it and a U.S. Uh, border guard. You might ask, why would a U.S. border guard and ATF agent be sitting in Caledonia? And it would probably tell you everything you need to know about the occupation. Because it wasn't about land. It was always about organized crime that was going on on the property. But the natives realized there's U.S. agents in Caledonia. So they swarmed the vehicle, roughed up the two OPP officers, put a knife to the throat of the ATF agent, all within 30, 40 feet of an OPP checkpoint. At that time, there was checkpoints throughout the entire town. Every crime I just described were within 30 feet of officers watching. And so when the native guy got done roughing up the, the OPP officer and putting a knife to the throat of the ATF agent, 
he walked over to the checkpoint. Now, you got to remember, this checkpoint is in front of people's homes. This is a, just a, a normal street in a subdivision. This is not somewhere else. This is just in front of people's homes. So by this time, people had come out. And the native puts up his hand and says, arrest me. Of course, the OPP don't do anything. He repeats it again, arrest me. OPP do nothing. He turns to the residents and says, see, they can't fucking touch us. You're next. And that's Caledonia. People, there, there's a guy named Sam Galtieri, has permanent brain damage because they beat him so badly they cracked his skull. And the OPP went and helped. You can go through story after story. And the OPP would do nothing to help the citizens. Nobody had property rights. Nobody. If they walked into your home and wanted to raid your fridge, the cops would do nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I couldn't believe this was happening in Canada. So I decided I was just going to create a website, just put up the videos and photos, that the Toronto media was refusing to report. Well, it didn't take very long before I was the most popular website regarding Caledonia because I was the only one who was posting the photos and the videos of what was going on. Well, you can imagine the response from the OPP and from the McGuinty government. They don't want to be exposed. They don't want someone showing the, the violence. The media was covering for them. The media wasn't reporting it. When Christy Blatchford from uh, the National Post, the Global Mail at the time, she wrote her book called Helpless, talking about Caledonia, she interviewed me and I said to her, that what I did in the month of June is I went through three months of the Toronto Sun newspaper because it was the supposedly the conservative newspaper, the law and order newspaper, and I wanted to see what photos they showed of the violence in Caledonia. You know, officers being beaten up, the fire bombing of the uh, power station, you know, cars on fire. You know, that would sell newspapers. The only photo in three months in the Toronto Sun, not even the left-wing newspapers, was a photo of a native chief shaking the hand of a resident. She didn't believe me. She hired someone to check out the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and the Toronto Sun, and she reports in her book, it's exactly true. That's the media, that's the police, and that's our government. At first, all I wanted to do is videotape, but very quickly it became clear the natives had put Mohawk warrior flags throughout the town, proclaiming Caledonia was no longer on Canadian soil that people's homes were no longer part of Canada. So my simple response was, I'm going to walk down the road with a Canadian flag. The OPP went nuts. All that other violence, they could tolerate that. They had a political solution for all that. But Fantino would bring in 400 officers and helicopters and riot squads to make sure I didn't walk down the road carrying a Canadian flag. When I found out it cost the OPP a quarter million dollars every day I walked down the road, because that's what it cost them, I just did it more. They may have endless money, but blowing it on me walking down the road with a Canadian flag certainly doesn't buy them boats anywhere else. So the OPP started getting creative. Got to put them in jail. Got to come up with some sort of charges. The first time I was arrested and put in jail, right from the orders of Fantino, emails right to the government, you got to find some way to get Gary McHale. That's Fantino's email to the government. Okay? So they then assigned lawyers who had all these meetings. And in their own reports, they acknowledged I was committing no offense, but officers were ordered to arrest me and put me in jail and forced me to appear before a judge because they wanted to get travel restrictions on, on me. Someone who has never committed a crime. So I was put in jail overnight. Of course, you can't get travel restrictions on somebody without a crime. 
So the judge just threw it out. Well, that enraged Fantino even more. He went on the radio. He went on TV. Matter of fact, within a couple of days after that being thrown out, the OPP travels to New York State and meets with a native PI who creates a neo-Nazi website under my name. My photos, my face, my wife, they claim I'm a neo-Nazi. What the OPP didn't realize is I didn't live in Caledonia. They realized that. I lived in Richmond Hill. That's York Regional Police. So when I saw the neo-Nazi website, I reported it to the police. So they launched an investigation. <laughs> Who's using my name? Now, I would have never found out about that report, uh, what the report said, except the second time they arrested me, they came up with a charge. Once they charged me, I have a right to all emails. They prosecuted me for 30 months. I was in court probably 100 times. They spent millions on me. I had Fantino on the stand for two and a half days. He had to answer my questions. Okay. And in the end, as part of the disclosure they had to give me, I got the uh, uh, York Regional Police report that gave the identity of the person who created the website, this, this native PI in New York State. At the same time, the OPP had done up a, a report to prove to the judge that I should not be allowed to travel to Caledonia. I was barred, legally barred from Caledonia for 30 months. But that report said the OPP had actually gone and visited and talked to that native PI. When you put the two reports together, when did the website start? The day after the OPP drove to New York State, talked to the native guy, the very next day he starts creating a neo-Nazi website. So, that's the corruption, and that's only a tip of what Fantino, who's now a cabinet minister in the Harper government, handpicked by Harper, he would send out emails telling his officers, I want you to overlook legal nuances. He would tell his officers, I do not want you to listen to Crown lawyers. I don't care if the court agrees with us, we will expose him as a troublemaker. Chris Lewis, who just retired as the commissioner, sent out an email in 2007 telling his officers, or agreeing with an email, that basically said, we have no evidence that Gary committed a crime, but you will arrest him and charge him. That's what the order was. I took that email to court, and we were the first in Canada to use a private prosecution to lay criminal charges against the highest ranking police officer in the province, Julian Fantino. I had him charged. <laughs> I had him charged with threatening the elected mayor because he wrote an email to the mayor and council and ordered them. You can never say anything positive about Gary McHale in public, and if you do, here are the four ways I will punish you. That's what he said in his email. A, Supreme, a Superior Court judge looked at that email and said it was a threat, and therefore he was a threatening elected official and issued the criminal charges against Fantino. We had other officers we had charged because we videotaped them helping natives build barricades, physically helping them build barricades so that the property owners could not use their property. We took that video to court. So what I want to deal with, so I got, you got the context. You got absolute, not just lawlessness, but the willful criminal behavior of senior brass in Caledonia. I've said it many, many times. I've written it in my book. I named the officers one by one. I talked about how they corrupted the justice system. It's been out for nine months. Why aren't any of them threatening to sue me? <laughs> right? I named the government lawyers who are corrupting the justice system. You can't go around saying a lawyer is corrupting the justice system without being threatened to be sued. So there's two issues we need to deal with. First one is 
An important event happened on June, January 30th, 1649. It affects all of us today. I like uh, Elizabeth's uh, presentation going back to the Magna Carta and stuff. You cannot imagine the number of times I use those documents in court. Well, on January 30th, 1649, Oliver Cromwell cut off the head of the king. Three years ago, I stood before the Court of Appeal because the government didn't like the fact that I was getting charges against the commissioner of the OPP. So they were asking the Court of Appeal to, to overturn my ability to lay a charge against government officials. And I started my presentation with the fact that since uh, 1649, it's now established by cutting off the head of the king. It doesn't matter if you're the peasant or you're the prime minister. You can be arrested and you can be prosecuted under the British common law. The court agreed with my presentation, ruled in my favor. That is now binding across Canada. It doesn't matter if you go into the courtrooms in Quebec or anywhere else, they quote our cases to establish that every citizen in this country not only has the right but the duty to uphold the honor of the king. It's on the federal government's website right now under private prosecution. The right to lay a charge against anybody is your right to uphold the honor of the king because all crimes are done against the king. And so what is the power of this? Well, in, the, in 1986, the government was getting a little concerned. You know, the, we got these old-fashioned laws, common law issues of private prosecution. Maybe we should do what the states have done and completely got rid of them. England has slowly phased them out. Uh, Australia is doing away with them. Maybe it's time for Canada to stop letting citizens do private prosecutions. Not that very many people were doing them. Well, the, these lawyers all got together. And their first report, they said, we think you should control what's going on here because this is the abuse of the justice system. Then they did their final report. And they said, on, on respection on what has actually occurred, we think all laws should be changed to empower private citizens to do private prosecution. They said in their report, Private prosecution is the last line of defense of democracy. The ability to lay a charge against a government official is our way of protecting democracy. Now that port report didn't just sit on the shelf. In 2002, the criminal code was changed from the beginning to the end so that the word prosecutor, which used to be the crown, now means you, or the crown. All throughout the criminal code, it's been altered in 2002. Special provisions have been put into the criminal code in 2002 that enables you not only to lay a charge, but if the judge doesn't agree with you, how you have the right to appeal that. Something that a police officer doesn't. So we were the first, it's called a mandamus, the, court, the judge, first time, the JP says to us, just the peace, oh, no, I can't lay a charge against a commissioner of the OPP. Like, I don't have that authority. Well, we've established that in law. Every citizen, if you have evidence of a crime by anybody, McGinty misusing money in the gas plant or any other criminal offense, you have a right to go before a justice of the peace, present that evidence, and lay the charge. Once that charge is issued, you are legally the prosecutor of the case. That's in law. It's always been that way. We, we somehow forget about <laughs> our common law history. We had, no pro and we had no crown prosecutors in British common law until 1880. Not one. The first crown prosecutor was hired by the government in 1880. So how were all criminal cases done prior to that? You and me. The authority to lay a charge is not rest with the police. 
it rests with you. They just happen to be employed to do that too. 